Good evening, everyone. Before we start our meeting, I would like to ask the Vice Chairman to read the opening statement. We will then have um, a momentary pause. Thank you. We're summoned here to make decisions which bind our authority for time to come. Let us do so in an atmosphere of dignity, goodwill, respect and calm. May those decisions be just and fair and in the long term best interests of the people who live and work in our beautiful county of Dorset. Thank you, Councillor Parks. So welcome everyone to our full council meeting. May I take the opportunity to remind members that for this evening's meeting, all members of council will debate the items in the normal way and will take a minded to decision. At the end of the debate, I will then ask the appropriate officer to take the formal decision under the extended delegated powers for openness and transparency. Agenda item one is apologies. Um, Susan, please could you advise us of apologies? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we've received apologies from Councillor Roland Tarr, Councillor David Gray, Councillor Sarah Williams, Councillor Tim Cook, Councillor Andy Canning, Councillor Rebecca Knox, Councillor Bill Pipe and Councillor Julie Robinson. Chairman, can we add uh, Councillor Bill Trite? He did contact me today. He may, if he's not here, he's not very well at the moment, so he's asked me to give his apologies. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Flower. Could we chairman. add those on then, please, Susan? Chairman, yes, chairman. I, uh, sorry, Chairman. Thank Could I uh, just you. add um, Councillor Matthew Hall, who is on his way to the meeting, but he's in traffic in Bristol or coming out of Bristol, so he will okay. make it later, OK? Thank you very much. So um, agenda item two is declarations of interest. Um, are there any declarations of interest, please? No? Well, we move straight on then to Chairman's announcements. As this is an informal meeting, I need to advise you that the minutes of the July meeting will be placed on the agenda at the next formal meeting of full council for formal ratification. Sadly, I have to report the death of former Dorset County Councillor John Peake, MBE. As former Councillor Peake was unknown to me, I've asked Councillor Jill Haynes to say a few words of tribute. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, uh, Chairman. Um, I'm Councillor Jill Haynes and I have the, um, the the ward of uh, what is now known as Chalk Valleys. I knew John for many years as my local councillor, but also through his wife, Benicia, and our shared love of horses. John was a man who loved Dorset, and in particular its countryside and farming heritage. He was to be seen at every country show, country, county show, sorry, and ploughing match, with always something to say and a question to ask. He was a great believer and supporter of our county farms estate and during his time on Dorset County Council was responsible for many of the tree planting schemes. Some were just little coppices of unused blocks of land, but he left a lasting legacy outside County Hall, the marvellous specimen trees and also the avenue of limes leaving Dorchester towards the A37. When he stepped down from Dorset County Council, I was selected to stand as the Conservative candidate for the area. John was incredibly generous and gave many hours of his time introducing me to the movers and shakers of what was to become the Three Valleys Ward. This was done on a strict timetable of timed visits which he'd arranged previously. But what impressed me the most was that some of those introductions were to people who would probably never consider voting Conservative, but nonetheless were important to the fabric of the community. He had a genuine interest in people and always made time to talk and ask questions, 
and making others felt that they were listened to. He was an avid attender of conservative party conferences, usually non knowledgeable and conscientious conservative supporter. He was always the first to jump to his feet to ask a question or challenge the speaker. And in all the years I knew him, he never stopped talking about the fact that the best way to judge a person's politics was to try and sell them a conservative raffle ticket, as well as urging all others to do the same thing. I was unable to attend his memorial service, but I did go and visit Venetia on a beautiful sunny afternoon, and we sat outside and reminisced about all the amusing things that had happened in his life. It was good to remember him in that way. He was a true countryman and a gentleman in both sense of the words. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Haynes. You painted a very um, interesting picture of someone that I know has earned the respect of an awful lot of people. Thank you. Agenda item four is public participation, questions and statements. I'd like to invite officers uh, to read out the questions and statements submitted by members of the public. Um, this evening, um, Matt Prosser gives his apologies, but um, we have uh, Aidan Dunn deputising for him. So question one is submitted by Holt Parish Council. And I will ask Aidan Dunn to read it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, councillors. Holt Parish Council has seen in recent months a significant increase in breaches of planning law. The criteria on the Dorset Council website are vague and undefined to anyone looking for guidance. This vagueness means that as a parish council, we are unsupported when making reports to the enforcement team for investigation and in fulfilling our own duty to represent our electors. We want Dorset Council to explain why it has set its own very vague criteria by which to investigate breaches, making it unclear it is fulfilling its obligations for enforcement. Thank you very much, Amy. And we will now hear a response by Councillor David Walsh. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Councillor David Walsh, portfolio holder for planning. Holt Parish Council state that they have seen a significant increase in breaches of planning law in recent months. The Council has also seen an increase in the number of enforcement cases across Dorset as a whole. The planning enforcement page on the Council's website currently provides a brief overview of the range of possible unauthorised development types. It sets out to report concerns and what we will do when we receive information about an alleged breach of planning control. The page includes a link to the Council's planning enforcement plan, which sets out in more detail as to how the Council will deal with notifications of alleged breaches and the steps taken during enforcement investigation. A link is also provided to the National Planning Practice Guidance on Enforcement. The Council is currently reviewing its planning enforcement plan. And as part of the review, we are aiming to include more detail on the options that are available to the Council to tackle breaches of planning control and how decisions are taken as to whether or not it is expedient to take action in each case. This review of the enforcement plan will hopefully address the com concerns <coughs> raised by Holt Parish Council in regards to the level of information currently provided on the Council's website. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Our second question is submitted by Hannah Kins. I hope I pronounced that properly, and will be um, read by Jonathan May. Thank you, councillors. Uh, question two, submitted by Hannah Kins. I won't read it word for word, councillors, because the question is on the screen. The question concerns works carried out by Wessex Water on Portland Beach Road and Portland Road and of the disruption that those works caused. And the question is, what protocols are placed on the utility companies when granted a license to dig up major roads with limited access? What do they need to do to mitigate traffic flow issues? 
And if protocols are in place, what actions are taken by Dorset Council if the utility companies do not comply? Do the utility companies get fined? And if they do, how is the money distributed afterwards? It has taken my daughter three hours to get to school this morning. Due to the last week, we knew there would be disruption caused and allowed extra time for it, but three hours is ridiculous. We also run a local restaurant on the island and this traffic issue has caused staff to be late getting home and to work. The other, the other side, it has, major, um, it has majorly impacted on our business, uh, which with the pandemic has already suffered. Will business be compensated for the failures of Wessex Water? Thank you, Jonathan. We will now receive a um, response to this question by um, Councillor Ray Bryan. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, Hannah Kearns, for the question. I'm pleased to report that within half an hour of her receiving her, com uh, her the, been identified as this as an issue. Both myself and Matt Pals made contact with her to try and resolve the situation as quickly as we could. However, I'm sorry for the inconvenience that was caused to the residents of Portland and Weymouth due to the works undertaken by Wessex Water recently on the A354. In January 2020, Dorset Council established the Dorset Council Permit Scheme under part three of the Traffic Management Act 2004 and the Traffic Management Permit Scheme Regulations 2007. The scheme gives Dorset Council the ability to manage and coordinate works and events on Dorset's highway network. When a permit is issued to allow works to take place, a number of conditions will be attached to it. These conditions relate to what activities the works promoter looking to perform and where on the network they are proposed to take place. In the case of the permit issued to Wessex Water for the emergency repair of a water leak at Ferry Bridge on the A354 in Weymouth, the following conditions were applied. Condition one, manual control between 7 and 7, 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Condition two, remove signals once work is complete. As part of the application process, the works promoter will need to submit traffic management proposals to Dorset Council for consideration. Depending on the likely impact of the work, this may also be accompanied by a joint site visit with the works promoter. This took place in August with members of the Dorset Council traffic team. Once the work is underway, the impact of the traffic management can be monitored through remote sensing, traffic flow telemetry and the site inspections from our highways inspectors. If a works promoter is found to be in breach of any of the conditions of the permit, the Dorsal Council permit scheme sets out a number of penalty actions which can be taken, including the issuing of fixed penalty notices in this instance, two fixed penalty not notices will be issued to Wessex Water. The revenue generated as a result of a fixed penalty notice are initially used to cover the cost of running the Dorset Council permit scheme, with any surplus generated being reinvested back into Dorset's highway network in the form of maintenance activities. The scheme is primarily funded through the levering of permit fees which are set at a level to allow the scheme to operate in a cost neutral manner. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Bryan. That's a very fulsome response. Question three is submitted by Sandra Reeve and will be read by Aidan Dunn. And Sandra Reeve writes, I noticed that last week there were only two days between the posting of the agenda for the Cabinet Committee and the cutoff time for public questions. This seemed very short. Please could you clarify whether at Dorset Council there is an agreed minimum time between posting of a committee's agenda online and the deadline given for questions from the public? If so, how many days is it? Thank you. Well, we'll 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, thank you for asking the question on public participation. We obviously welcome members of the public to ask questions at our cabinet, committee or full council meetings. Dorset Council is required to publish agenda papers five working days prior to the meeting. So in the case of the last cabinet meeting, the agenda was published on the 27th of October to meet the statutory deadline. Members of the public can submit questions or statements either related to specific items on the agenda or items that relate to the business of the particular meeting. The deadline for a submission is three working days prior to the meeting, providing two full days for the submission of questions. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Flower. Uh, we will receive a further question, which will be read by Jonathan May. Thank you, Chairman. In Somerset, all garden waste is composted within the county and turned into Revive, a high quality recycled compost through a contractor called Biffa. They produce two grades of high quality organic compost or soil conditioner that's suitable for commercial and domestic use. Does Dorset Council plan to initiate a similar scheme in Dorset so that local people can have access to banks of organic compost at their local recycling centres or bulk quantities directly from the contractor? Thank you, Jonathan. We will now receive a response from Councillor Jill Haynes. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I'm Jill Haynes. I have the portfolio for customer and community services, and that includes waste services. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank you for the question. Um, Dorset's garden waste is recycled by our contractor, Eco Sustainable Solutions. They produce a wide range of compost products made from the garden waste, which is available for home delivery, commercial collection, or via a wide range of local garden centres. Full details of these can be provided via the link. Now, I can't show you the link below, but basically it's uh, this is eco uh, and we will make sure that that is. And there is also uh, country, county care products, which will show you the locations where it's sold at garden centres. And we'll make sure that, that link is on our website, but it's also in the minutes too. In the past, this service has been provided at household recycling centres. However, with the need to increase waste separation for improved reuse and recycling opportunities within the centre, which require us to provide additional containers on site, this meant that the sale of compost from the site was stopped. This separation, reuse and recycling of so many different items is one of the many reasons that Dorset Council has one of the highest recycling rates in the country. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Haynes. Question five was submitted by Rosemary Lunt and will be read by Aidan Dunn. Dorset's Climate and Ecological Emergency Strategy and Action Plan were adopted on the 15th of July 2021 at a meeting of the full council. Three months after having been adopted, the up-to-date ecological and emergency strategy and action plan are still not available on the Dorset Council website. As I write on the 8th of October, the website still has the original draft strategy, which is dated the 15th of July 2020, and the accompanying action plan. Question is, when will the updated and official versions of the strategy and action plans be made available and Given that they are supposed to be living documents, what is the forward schedule for further updates? Thank you, and we will receive a response from Councillor Ray Bryan. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, at the time the strategy and action plans were adopted, we were in the middle of changing website software and migrating website content. This work has now been completed and the latest version of the strategy is now available online at the Climate Emergency web pages on www.dorsetcouncil.gov.uk forward slash climate hyphen strategy. Related changes to the web, the, uh, web pages, action plans and technical papers are coming very soon, but those who can 
but those who can access the strategy PDF file will have everything they need. As noted, the strategy and action plans will be living documents that will be updated as progress is made. We have, we have committed to produce a buyout first of which will be published to the Council's Place and Resources Scrutiny Committee on the 16th of November this year. It is envisaged that future published updates to the strategy and action plans will align with these reports. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bryan. <clears throat> Question six was submitted by Helen Sandler and will be read by Jonathan May. Thank you, Chairman. So this question concerns agenda item eight on your agenda tonight, um, the Dorset Council plan. Uh, the economic growth priority section states that Dorset Council will improve rail services, public transport and the reliability of journey times by working with providers, lobbying government and focusing on schemes to ease congestion. In the light of this, and bearing in mind the lack of a current implementation plan, for LTP3, could I ask what progress it, uh, what progress is with the development of the revised local transport plan prepared jointly with BCP Council? At the Cabinet meeting on 2nd March 2021, the draft timetable showed that this plan would be consulted on in autumn 2021, ahead of formal adoption in winter 2021-22. Thank you, Jonathan, and we will receive a response from Councillor Ray Bryan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Due to further alignment of local plan timescales between the two authorities, conflicted demands on resource and changing guidance, including the recently public transport decarbonisation plan, the work on the revised local transport plan has been delayed. Officers and both authorities have drawn up a revised timeline which moves through various stages of scoping, consultation and development during 2022 before being adopted in spring stroke summer 2023 to align with both local plans. In the meantime, officers and members continue to seek the enhancements referred to through local schemes. The Bus Service Improvement Plan and subsequent enhanced partnership, Network Rail, sorry, Network Rail Line review processes and other channels such as the sub-national transport body. I hope that answers the question. If not, please contact me and I'll give you as much information as I can. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for that, Councillor Bryan. Our final question this evening, um, it's question seven is submitted by John Doak and Aidan Dunn will read it. Thank you, Chair. Submitted by Joe Doak. The draft local plan is currently missing a number of important reports and studies which are necessary for the proper planning of the council area. These are listed on the local plan webpage, although the Dorchester Civic Society is of the view that the plan also lacks an effective transport strategy and an up-to-date strategic market housing assessment and strategic sustainability appraisal. Without these documents, it can be argued that the current draft is unsound and that the local plan process should be restarted. The hurry to proceed with a draft local plan before an adequate and up-to-date evidence base has been established undermines the credibility of the whole plan. The Dorchester Civic Society would like to know the detailed timings for the publication of these missing reports and any other local plan research reports that are currently underway, bearing in mind that their findings will require sufficient time to be properly evaluated. Thank you very much, Aidan. We will receive a response from Councillor David Walsh. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Mr Doak, for your question and the opportunity to update on this. A number of evidence studies are currently in progress and officers will send details of these studies and their anticipated completion dates to the questioner directly. The sustainability appraisal is an iterative document that helps inform the local plan throughout its preparation. The next published version will be produced alongside the local plan. 
but it will be amended again as the plan makes its way through the examination process. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Um, that concludes our questions and public participation from members of the public. Um, agenda item five, there are no petitions or deputations. So we move on to agenda item six, which is announcements and reports from the leader. Thank, thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, no, so finish. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, I, I'm not going to go through all of it. It'll get pub the uh, bulletin will get published um, later this evening. But I want to pick on two particular issues, uh, colleagues, and one is the budget pressures for for 22-23. Um, uh, we all know how challenging the current uh, budget year is, um, but it's not going to get any better for next year either. Um, and I'd comment on a couple of things, really. You know, we all know that Dorset's a wonderful county and many people choose to move to Dorset to retire. And this means we have a higher than average number of older people living in the county, 29%, for example, um, aged over 65, compared to a national figure of around 19%. Um, while many of the older residents are healthy and thriving and play a valuable role in our communities, it does also mean that Dorset Council faces a higher level of demand for older people's social care services than many other areas which place significant pressures on the council's budgets. And we've heard this on a number of occasions. Um, I've written in recent weeks to government ministers and have continued lobbying via the Dorset MPs on a range of issues, in particular, the funding crisis faced, um, faced by local government in our health and social care system. This year, Dorset Council's predicted to an increase in the gross cost of care services paid for by the council of around 7%, or £10.3 million. Pounds. This increase is due to a combination of more people needing care and an increase in the unit cost of care charged by providers to the council. So it's it's a, it's a perfect storm. It's not going to go away. Um, we've, we've had the pandemic, mm -hmm. which has had a massive impact uh, on our service delivery uh, colleagues, and it's not going to not going to change very much overnight. So I, I've commented on that, and you'll see the detail of that in the bulletin but I wanted just to dwell on the um, we talk about ambitions and you know you see stuff in the press around the council's ambitions and all councils should have ambitions and we've certainly got one a number of ambitions actually in, in Dorset but one that uh, that strikes me at the moment is the ambition for Dorset's children and young people uh, and I've spent a little bit of time in my bulletin talking about the um, investment of 37 and a half million pounds uh, and the uh, purchase of the St Mary's, which is now called the uh, Dorset Innovation Centre near Shaftesbury, and many other facilities that are, will uh, uh, roll out across Dorset. We will be giving the young people of Dorset a much better ch chance in life. Hopefully we can bring them back into the county. Too many young people have to go out of the county because we haven't got the provision. So I've dwelled on that as well because I think it's really important. And we've um, offset have just completed a three week inspection of children's services. The inspection was very thorough and rigorous, as you'd expect. I'd like to take this opportunity to give my thanks to everyone working in children's services for all that they've done to improve the quality of care and services we provide, working relentlessly throughout the pandemic and beyond. We'll get the Ofsted judgment in late November, and I hope it will reflect the high level of commitment and care of our children and young people. Thank you, Chairman. That, that's my, my, I've commented on some parts of my um, bulletin, but I wanted to comment on something else that was brought to my attention today, and that's um, uh, I, I'm aware that from Councillors Sherry Jesperson, Knock Lacey Clark, uh, Jane Somper, and Byron Quayle, who represent Blandford and surrounding villages, a very serious situation affecting their communities. Members may be aware of the closure of the service at the Blandford Group Medical Practice. <coughs> this was done without warning, leaving 24,000 patients without access to their normal GP services, prescriptions and all sorts of other things. No vaccination schedule. It has um, enormous distress, caused enormous distress, anger and fear amongst residents, which we were without very little notice and no time for resumption of service. Whilst GP services are not run by Dorset Council, I know that residents look to our councillors for support and speak to them in a crisis. And like this one, that 
what's what the councils have done. Um, the medical practice stated it on its website that the problem was due to a lapse of public liability insurance. And though our insurance manager um, offered to help the practice for, to find cover they needed, although we received no response to this offer, and I'm pleased to say the practice has now been able to find replacement cover. This is an important um, lesson, Chairman, uh, learned from what, what went wrong in Blanford. And I'm therefore asking the Council's People and Health Scrutiny Committee to call for evidence to establish what caused the loss of service and what needs to be done to prevent it from happening again, whether it's in Blandford or elsewhere in Dorset. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Flan. Thank you. The change to item seven is questions from councillors. Um, and I'm going to invite each councillor to ask their question in turn. Question one will be put by Councillor Kate Weller. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, good evening, colleagues. Um, in the general scheme of, of the matters you'll be addressing this evening, this question will seem rather trivial, but I've received a number of messages from residents to whom it is a concern. At the outset, I want to make it clear that I'm a great supporter of the Ironman competition and indeed regret that we are unable to host the full event anymore. The problem is the schedule of events. It was always the case that promoters would submit their plans and a schedule was agreed so that there were no undue clashes as far as possible. Of course, this can be difficult. So many events and a finite number of weekends. The Battle of Britain is remembered across the country on the first Sunday after the 15th of September. This year, the service was unable to take place because the Ironman was also taking place on that weekend and access for those wishing to attend was considered far too difficult. This was distressing for many people for whom the memorial is significant. I don't know who or what department deals with event scheduling these days, or if anyone has oversight of such scheduling. My question is, could we try a little harder to ensure that events that might be low key, but still important, are not eased out of our calendars because higher earning events are taking place? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weller. Uh, we will receive a response from Councillor Ray Bryan. Thank you, Chairman. And as always, uh, it's the, the no such thing as a trivial question, Councillor Weller. And when you have local people requesting information from you, it's our duty to answer their questions. So thank you for the question. The traffic team administer, administer approximately 200 event closures and 900 road closures relating to street works that take place on the highway each year. The scheduling of events is always difficult due to the number of events that happen across Dorset. The Battle of Britain service is not an event that we have received notification from an organiser in the past or for this year. We do contact event organisers at the beginning of the calendar year that applied for a road closure of traffic management for their event in the previous calendar year to enable us to gain a schedule of events for the next year. However, there are limitations to this. As above, this will be only those events that have direct impact, impact on the highway. If an event does not have <laughs> highway impact, we are unlikely to be made aware of it. These, for example, could be events held on private property, etc. With specific reference to the Ironman, the event date is determined by a number of factors relating to the event and is agreed as a fixed date within the calendar as part of our host venue agreement for the next three years. If there are specific events, Ironman or not, that experience clashes not limited to events, roadworks can also cause clash. We can work with the event organised to see if there is a solution to mitigate the impact and discuss access arrangements and ultimately work so that events can coexist where possible. <laughs> I would I would add, Councillor Weller, if the uh, if the Battle of Britain service want to get in touch with me direct, I will do everything I can to help them 
be able to uh, carry out their event. The Battle of Britain is something we ought to acknowledge and be very proud of. So thank you for the question. Th thank you very much, Councillor Brown. Um, if that's OK with you, I'll ask them to contact you. It, it always takes place at the same weekend each year, so it, it's it's not a movable feast. So thank you very much indeed for your, for your response. Thank you both. Question two is from Councillor Maria Rowe. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, one of the good news stories which came out of the Conservative Party conference was that the Prime Minister pledges no homes to be built on green fields. He also promised the same thing when he was the London Mayor to the people of London. These promises are like music to my ears and it's very reassuring news. Can people in my ward where every single new house in the local plan is to be built on Greenbelt, celebrate this wonderful news. Thank you, Councillor Rowe. Uh, we will ask um, David Walsh, Councillor David Walsh, to give you a response, please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Rowe, for the question. It gives me the opportunity to clarify this point. Despite the recent statements, national policy has not changed and still expects local planning authorities to plan to meet the housing needs of their areas. Dorset is a rural area with limited brownfield land, and if no greenfield development were to take place, we would be unable to meet our housing requirements, and there would be significant adverse effects on the local economy and housing affordability. Not all greenfield land is greenbelt. The council is considering the release of some greenbelt land for development, but this can only take place in exceptional circumstances and will be fully tested through the plan making process. Should national policy change, this would take an account in the local plan. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Question three is um, from Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Uh, good. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everyone. Um, a recent report from the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee concludes the scale of the challenge to retrofit existing homes to tackle the climate crisis is enormous. Energy efficiency is a precursor to the transition to low carbon heat, so action must be taken in the 2020s to set homes on a decarbonisation strategy to meet our net zero targets. Bridport and many other parts of Dorset, many of these existing homes have had requests to install energy efficiency measures, including the installation of double glazing, refused by our planning system because they are listed buildings. These listed buildings are nothing grand. Many are simple terraced houses that have been occupied by generations of working families and the installation of double glazing would lead to less than substantial harm to their significance as a heritage asset. Could I have an assurance that the new Dorset local plan will take a different attitude to listing building consent and positively encourage the retrofitting of energy efficiency measures? Thank you, Councillor Clayton. We will receive a response from David Walsh. <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Clayton, for this question, which I'm sure we will continue to debate in the local plan EAP that we're both on. Now, the local plan must be in accordance with national policy, which includes the protection of listed buildings, as well as on energy efficiency. The planning white paper included the suggestion that national policy on this matter might be changed to give increased priority to energy concerns. And if this happens, it will be followed in the local plan. In the meantime, the plan will seek to maximise the opportunities for energy efficiency measures while continuing to protect the area's heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Um, our fourth and final question is also from Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I have been contacted by more than one professional involved in submitting planning applications 
expressing their concern with the planning process within Dorset since we became a unitary authority. Of particular concern are the timescales involved in simply acknowledging applications, let alone in processing them. I understand that the increase in people working from home has led to an increase in applications and that the amalgamation of various planning systems into one has been a challenge. But I need to be able to reassure people who are getting increasingly frustrated by the delays and I need to be able to reassure those small business owners whose business development plans are being held up by the delays. When can residents and build business owners expect acknowledging and processing times to return to normal? Thank you, Councillor Clayton. And a further response, please, from Councillor David Walsh. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Councillor Clayton, for the opportunity to reassure people on this point. I hope that you read my Cabinet report this week or possibly last week. I've lost track of the days. Um, that gave a, a more detailed response to where we are on validation and passing on the baton to decision making and planning. As to your question, following recent recruitment to a number of posts in our technical support teams, we now no longer have a validation backlog in our southern and western committee area. The teams are also working hard to clear the validation backlog in the eastern and northern committee areas with the aim of all validation backlogs being cleared by the end of this year. <coughs> This will mean that planning applications will be validated promptly. It will take longer to clear the decision backlogs and achieve our aim of determining most planning applications within the statutory timeframes, usually eight or 13 weeks. We are aiming to make significant progress on clearing the decision backlog by April 2022, but applicants and agents should start to see improvements sooner than this, given the positive progress on reducing validation timescales. I would just like to add that the communications on this is being sent out to all agents and developers that we have communication with. They are being kept updated all the way through this. But thank you for raising the subject, Councillor Clayton. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. That's most helpful. Uh, now we come to agenda item eight, the Dorset Council Plan. And I'm going to ask Councillor Peter Wolf to introduce the report and propose the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Peter Wharf, uh, Cabinet Member of Portfolio Holder for Corporate Development and Change and Deputy Leader. Um, it gives me great pleasure to, to present this report. It has been through a variety of processes. It went to the Cabinet meeting in June. It went to uh, overview committees who reviewed it in quite a lot of detail. And I'd like to thank the members of the two overview committees uh, for the time and the work they put into it. Uh, they held an informal workshop which provided a number of recommendations, most of which have been followed up. And one of the key recommendations was that the climate and ecological change becomes a priority rather than just literally going around the whole thing and, and being part of the inter interrelated actions and priorities. So we now have a further single priority, which is climate change, which will need to be taken into account of uh, along with all of the others. Uh, so. From that overview committee, uh, a number of changes were made and in particular, the introduction was made clearer and we put information which clarified some of the special characteristics of Dorset. We uh, put some links into the key areas within the report and there was a significant discussion at the overview committees as to whether we should change the name because it was felt that the name might be slightly confusing with our local plan, as in the development local plan. Um, the discussion took quite a long time and there was no hugely strong feeling between whether we should change the name. A number of names were put forward. I have since spent quite some time with our Commons Department and they are of the view, and I agree with this, that the key actions that we should be taking are to differentiate the council plan from the local plan 
rather than changing the name now, which might confuse people as to what it is and what it was. So I don't intend to propose that we change the name, uh, but I do intend that we propose that we approve this plan and there will be a single sheet, uh, a one, pay, one, on, one item on a page, which we will produce and there'll be delegated responsibility for the production of that. So I recommend this for approval, Chairman. It has been through a very detailed process and I thank everybody for the help they've given. Thank you, Chairman. Thank, thank you, Council. Thank, thank you, Council. Can... I've got an echo all of a sudden. Um, I, I do, do understand, understand Councillor Council Spencer Flower would like to second this proposal, is that correct? Yes, indeed, Chairman. And I, can I echo Peter's comments? So I've got nothing to add. <laughs> He's been very eloquent as always, set it out. Good piece of work by all of every, all members who have been involved in bringing this, refreshing it and bringing it forward. It's a, it's a live document. It's something we, we, we need to, to treasure and use productively in helping to uh, take the council the forward and, and dealing with the, the challenges that we're, we're faced with. So more than happy to second, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Flair. I, it appears we have a um, request to speak declaration from Councillor Holloway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just re-reading the report on the local plan, it states in the economic about Dorset Innovation Park. Now, I have to declare that I do have a small business there, so I would appreciate if I could have uh, legal just to advise me on that. Is that going to affect me to be able to vote on this tonight? Thank you. Thank you. We'll ask uh, Jonathan Mayor. Thank you. Chairman, could I just confirm with Councillor Holloway, ha is this an interest that you've declared in the register of disclosable pecuniary interests? Yes, it is. It is. No, it is. It is in my register of interests. It is. Chairman, I, I think in that case, um, Councillor Hol Holloway should um, declare that to the meeting as he has done and um, withdraw for the meeting uh, for this item, which for the purposes of a, a meeting on online, I think if you can just turn off your um, turn off your camera and, and then uh, we'll in, invite you back in in a moment. Thank you. Uh, but not not to take any any part in this item at all beyond having made the declaration. Thank you, Councillor Holloway. Um, Councillor Shane Bartlett requests to speak. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And uh, thank you to the officers and the portfolio holders for the work they've done this plan. But you will be aware, and I do appreciate it's a living document, but I, I, you will be aware that I have raised my concerns previously, both in the webinars and in the um, cabinet meeting about having a strong representation within this plan surrounding us providing suitable housing and the necessary housing for young people to keep them in the county. And I just want to reiterate that again. Um, I didn't see anything in the suitable housing section of it or the strong healthy community section of it or in the uh, appendices with those discussions that went on. Um, I think when we look at the suitable housing, we're looking from 2019 to 2029, an increase of 65 plus year olds to 20 percent and a decrease a decrease of 3 percent of a working age population. And we all know this isn't sustainable for this county to continue at that present rate. And by 20 years, we'll be in a position where we have more retirees in the county than we will have a working age population. So can I just ask again, and I know it's a live document, that we are going to address this we, and we will put the suitable measures in place for to bring forward housing for young people and young families so that we're not losing them out of the county at the rate we are using them. And also that it's obviously going to be a need for it to be a policy within the new local plans we formulate that. And I appreciate Council Walk that you've done, that you, you and your team have done a lot of work on this, but you know my feelings on this and it's very strong. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wolf, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, I, I have a huge degree of sympathy and support for Councillor Shane Bartlett's views on this. Uh, clearly, we can't change the laws of supply and demand, but what we can do is we can construct a local plan, not the council plan, which reflects the requirement for significant additional building, and we can have uh, major parts of the developments providing affordable housing. However, I, I 
always put the caveat that affordable housing isn't necessarily affordable. It is just a technical term. And I'm afraid to say that, the, that we are governed by the laws of supply and demand, and I won't be able to change those. What I can do is try and make minor changes by having the, the, um, the, the sense in the council plan but David Walsh in the local plan is working extremely hard in order to have very significant affordable housing targets in order to be able to provide the housing, the sort of housing you're talking about in order to try and encourage young people to stay here. Thank you, Thank Chair. You. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wolf. Uh, we have a request to speak from Councillor Kelvin Clayton. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I obviously support the recommendation that the climate and ecological emergency become one of the main priorities of the Council. Achieving even our most modest carbon reduction targets, however, will require that our climate and ecological emergency strategy and action plan becomes fully integrated into all areas of our work and becomes a key feature of our budget not just something paid for out of government grants. There will also be many occasions when delivery of the strategy and action plan is at odds with other priorities, most noticeably as the leader of the council notes with economic growth. To ensure that delivery of this strategy and action plan becomes our most absolute priority, becomes fully integrated across all departments and to help resolve the tensions within economic growth. Could I suggest, as this is a living document, that we consider the appointment of an executive director with the sole responsibility for its delivery, perhaps the executive director for climate change, ecology and the economy? Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Would you like to respond to that, um, Councillor Wolf, or just uh, um, not uh, well, agreement? I, I will. No, I will. I'm, I'm, that needs to be the subject of quite considerable discussion, and we don't appoint executive directors for another function as a result of one councillor raising it at this particular meeting. Uh, we have an organisation structure that we put a significant degree of effort into. And we have an overview committee that looks into personnel and I would suggest that that committee reviews your request to decide whether they want to make any recommendation. But I'm certainly not going to agree to the recruitment of, of a new position as currently undefined because it's just not the right way to organise a business. We went through a huge degree of effort in constructing the organisation and the organisation chart and I do not want to ch change it or tinker with it in order to meet one person's suggestion. So I'm suggesting that uh, Councillor Clayton takes his request to the overview committee the, that deals with personnel and they can review it if they wish to do so. Thank you, Councillor Wolf. Thank you, Councillor Clayton. Um, Councillor Penfold. Thank you very much, Chairman. It's a question for Jonathan Mayer, please. Um, there is a planning application submitted on a piece of land that I own, which is in my desk declaration of interest, but this is by a third party. Could you please give me some guidance on whether I vote or not? Sorry, Chairman, can I just make a point that we are debating the council plan and not the local plan? The local plan. And, and yes. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not sure that your question is relevant to the council That's plan. All right then, fine. But I, I mean, I, I'm okay. happy for Jonathan to give a view, but that, that would be my view. Thank you. Chairman, I'm, I'm happy to confirm that position. If this was a debate about um, the local plan and this particular planning application was relevant to it and it related to a councillor's own financial position, then absolutely you, sh you should not be taking part. Um, but this is about, is about the, count the council plan and that doesn't relate to individual um, developments that uh, the councillors might might be involved in as far as I can see. Thank, thank you very much. I just wanted to be sure. Thank no, you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Penfold. Um, Councillor Andrew Kirby. 
Hello, evening. Thank you, Chair. Um, I um, I welcome the leader's comments earlier. He he mentioned that 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 Dorset does have an aging population, and um, I um, it's funny actually. I think Shane and I are twins, perhaps separated from birth by a few years, and um, because the the with regards to affordable housing and, and keeping our younger people in Dorset, it's something that I made at at, at my committee, and I I fundamentally I fundamentally welcome that. Um, but I think one of the things that we we haven't really really pushed. It's in the document, but it's not really there. Um, is that as a result of our aging population, our adult social care budget is going up and up and up. Our demographics are unsustainable. Dorset is dying. Now I'm not saying to people go forth and procreate and, and do your bit, although I have, um, to, to, to keep ourselves going. Um, my view is that we need to keep our older people healthier for longer. And by keeping them healthier for longer, we therefore reduce the amount of time that they're in care or utilising our services and actually having a better life will stop. My view is that this can only be done by utilising prevention at scale. And I know I harp on about this continuously, but by being able to use our place-based services, by being able to use services that are outside of adult services, that's the only way that we can reduce our adult service, our, our adult social care bill. Admittedly, it will take a long time and it will take perhaps a generation, but we're going to have to be brave. The only way that we can do this is by spending our money and resources and time in our former, what I would call our former district services, like our green spaces, ensuring that our people are healthy, that they can cycle to school, ensuring that our planning is right, that it's safe, that people are, are not um, it, um, affected by crime, that people can go out and, and, and again, the, their buildings are conducted to their health, ensuring that our housing is in place, and that it's not mouldy. I think I remember something from the King's Fund saying that for every one pound spent on housing, it reached 13 pounds worth of health benefits or something, something like that. So my push is, and my steer is really clear, and I know this is a bit cheeky because it's not quite a question, but I'll phrase it at the end of the question, is that why isn't it made so clear in the document? Actually, that's not really very good English. I think Peter's going to tell me off. Why is the, can we make it clearer in the document that we support a prevention at scale agenda and that we, I, I, I think personally, it's the biggest threat to Dorset Council, and that's not reflected in the Dorset Council plan. There thank we go. you, Councillor Kirby. Thanks, Chairman, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, I, I completely agree with Councillor Kirby, prevention at scale. Uh, I would make two points. One is there is, there is quite a bit about that in the Council plan in terms of where we're going, but we are not masters of the destiny of this. We work with a number of other partners uh, and we do not have absolute control over this. So it's something we can't set ourselves an absolute target because as you know, Councillor Kirby, the CCG and a variety of other partners. Uh, I've just been quietly texting Councillor Laura Miller uh, and through you chair if you don't mind i'd like to get councillor miller just to come in briefly to talk about what we're doing to follow up what councillor kirby so eloquently talks about because we are doing a lot on that and councillor miller i think can just very briefly just talk about it thank you if that's all right with you chair of course thank you you're muted councillor okay thank you chair and, and thank you councillor wolf and thank you councillor kirby because i absolutely agree with you um, we, we do do this work, you, you know, because you're involved with it and involved with it really, really well through public health. Um, one of the, it, it is true that Dorset has um, greater pressure from um, over the over 85 and over 65 age group. And one of the key things we can do is keep, keep people healthy for longer. Um, not just because it saves us money, but because it's the right thing to do. Uh, people want to stay at home. They don't want to go and live in residential care unless it's absolutely crucial. Um, Oh, sorry, I should have said who I am. I'm the Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Health. Apologies. Um, that, that wasn't very helpful, was it? Um, so, so, so this is a huge um, challenge for us. It, it is difficult. Uh, you know, uh, Councillor Kirby, I've been in a situation where housing was a challenge for me. Um, I've also done my bit to increase the uh, school age population of Dorset. But on the adult social care, we know that dementia is, is the steam train that's coming down the line. Um, we've got uh, plans in motion that, that we think we can try to, to influence the market and, and try to provide suitable accommodation, nursing, care for people with, with sort of high acuity dementia. 
that's probably our biggest cost pressure. Um, so if you couple that with the work that we will do, are doing and will continue to do um, through public health um, to keep people healthier at home for longer, um, you read a lot about waiting lists in our acute hospitals. Prevention um, in, the, in our communities has a huge amount to do with reducing waiting lists. And of course, if people don't go into hospital in the first place, then they don't need care when they come out. And, and we need to get that. That balance at the moment is, is, a, is a bit wrong, I think, um, partly due to COVID um, and partly due to the fact that we need to recognise that people want to stay at home. And we talk a lot about a strength based approach and asking people what they can do, what they want to do. Um, you know, and our, our learning disabilities is a, is a large cost pressure as well. Um, we saw today um, a student uh, from Employee Mobility has now gone into full time career as a chef. That's the kind of opportunities we want to be creating for our adults with um, learning disabilities of a working age, um, keeping our older people fitter and healthier and at home for longer. You're absolutely right. That's got to be our ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um... That was really um, very strong uh, and forceful reason to support the um, recommendation. Thank you. I have uh, three people requesting to speak and then we will take the vote, please. So, Councillor John Andrews. Yeah, thank you very, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, I totally commend uh, the report. Um, uh, what Councillor Bartlett said and Councillor Kirby said is absolutely true. One of the key segments in our economic or our Dorset plan is economic growth. Um, I'd like to kick the backside out of the economic growth and wonder who is dealing with it. I know it's probably John Selgren, who's probably the most overworked uh, executive director in the in the whole of the whole of the place. Um, so I would just like there to be some focus on economic growth because without economic growth and bringing those jobs in, those affordable houses won't be affordable because they won't be able to afford them because they're not earning enough money. Um, so we need to go, like, as Councillor Flower said in his thing uh, earlier, St Mary's is a site that there's going to be some innovation on. I don't know what innovation that is. I don't know who was talking about the innovation part, but we need to be building those high tech industries on that innovation park and those two sites to ensure that the people of Dorset and the young people of Dorset uh, are enabled to stay in the county. Um, so I commend what everybody is saying and, and support the report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Andrews. Um, I, for its worth, I totally agree with everything you've said. So, um, Councillor Louis O'Leary. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I know this report, I mean, it's been through a load of scrutiny. Councillor Wolf's done a very good job on it. Um, talk about economic growth. Economic growth is the is, should be our one of our key things to move forward on. Um, you speak to residents is one of the things they're keen on. But the thing is, and I've said it at previous meetings, um, it's OK getting the jobs, but you need the people for those jobs. It's OK having the people, the skills, but it's getting them the jobs that those skills need. Um, I think, you know, it'd be really good to have more of a focus on things such as apprenticeships, I think we're too reliant at the minute on seasonal economy as well as public sector jobs and getting those high tech, good skilled private sector jobs coming here is good. But we also need to train up our own people to uh, to be ready for those jobs. Um, paying a, a new executive director um, for climate change is not not what we need at all. We actually need to focus on economic job, economic growth and getting the people for those jobs. And that should be our own people first on that one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Leary. Uh, next, uh, actually, we've got Councillor Ray Bryan snuck in on the end. And seeing as it's him, I will extend this um, so that we have Councillor Paul Kimber and then lastly, Councillor Ray Bryan. Uh, thank you, Chair and uh, fellow councillors. And, uh, if I can, uh, as, as, as the only member of the Labour Party, congratulate uh, Councillor Andrew Kirby. I thought it was quite uh, inspired by by what he said. And, I, and, uh, and Peter, I will be supporting this tonight. But there's a lot of things that we've said tonight that I can completely agree with. It's fair to say, I, th I think, first of all, probably one of the biggest issues will be don't let's start dishing climate change 
uh, is probably one of the biggest issues that people stop and talk to me about and, and more than anything and and the council's res response but also uh, Louis you're dead right economic development is is important I've had three uh, I've had a, an emergency in my house and I've had three builders in today all young guys but all three guys do not live in their own homes they rent the homes and it's I just see this as a real impossible task we're trying to keep our young young people and I couldn't go through a whole meeting without talking about Portland we need every <laughs> bit of help for our young people thank you very much thank you very much Councillor Kimber so lastly we'll hear from Councillor Ray Bryan uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for allowing me to uh, at least say a few words. Uh, a couple of things that have been mentioned from people during the debate, and one of the highlights in the, in the report that we have in front of us is the 19 million that we are already being awarded by central government towards our target of 130 million that we're going to spend on climate change uh, on the proposed strategy or the uh, the strategy in front of us. I can tell you now that the 19 million uh, had a target date at the end of September. We've managed to get that extended until the end of March. So the work will continue at a pace. And I'm pleased to report that uh, we've currently spent about 4 million of it. And the rest of it is uh, work in progress. Um, uh, so I just thought I'd just update everybody on that just to say how well that is going. I'd like to pick up on something Councillor Kirby said and obviously not wishing to step on uh, Councillor Miller's toes, but I'm going to give a, pro a real plug for green space on the health and well-being. It was mentioned by Councillor Kirby uh, and, and we have to uh, realise that a lot of the facilities we have in green space, be it rights of way, which keep people fit and healthy, the walkways, the new cycleways we're introducing, uh, across everywhere, specifically in the southeast at the moment, but more to follow, let me tell you. Uh, the adoption of bringing bikes into certain areas, uh, that's all for the future to try and keep people healthy. This is all part of this major local plan. For those that don't go to Moores Valley, go and have a look at the sterling work that has happened there over the last 12 months. Ride one of the bikes around some of the uh, the pathways. It's a great way of keeping yourself fit and healthy and we have a duty to continue to deliver these sort of facilities for our residents. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> sorry, thank you very much. We will now. Can I just make, sorry, Chairman, can I just yes. make a few closing remarks because yes. uh, a number of uh, really important issues have been raised. Um, can I thank the members for the interest they've shown? I'm very grateful. Uh, I haven't come armed with all of the detail that we'll be able to answer some of the questions, but I would point out that we are one of the largest uh, recruiters and employers of apprentices in the county, uh, and we have used apprentices right across the piece. It's a very important issue that we're following up. Can I also point out that um, Whilst I agree with a lot of what people said, the, the various themes are in many ways in tension between each other. There is a tension between looking after our green and beautiful county and in building houses in order to accommodate people. And what we have to do is we have to balance those tensions all the way through. And we do so by having an understanding of what the key drivers are, which are the tensions in the in the roundel that you can see behind me, which will be changed. But also with the overview committees and this sort of debate, which will guide us to make informed decisions which will sometimes be quite difficult so I thank the members for the debate I thank the staff for the effort they've put into this uh, and I would ask people to continue to uh, extol the virtues of the council plan thank you thank you very much councillor wolf um, uh, an impassioned plea there I would say um, and so much good work has gone into this um, Right, we will now take the vote, please. Hopefully it'll come up in, on our screens. Chairman, Chairman, the voting form is now in the chat bar. 
If any members have any technical difficulties in voting tonight, please could I ask that they wait until I ask for verbal votes once all of the electronic votes have been received? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Chairman, I think all the electronic votes have now been received. Can I just check if there's any member who's had any difficulty in voting? No, in which case I can tell you that there were 69 votes in favour of the recommendations, one vote against and one abstention. Therefore, the minded to decision is to approve the recommendations. Thank you very much and congratulations to Councillor Wall. Um, Having taken the minded to vote, we will now ask. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. We will now ask Mr. Aidan Dunn to take the formal decision under delegated powers. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Having listened to the debate and having taken into account that members would have been minded to support the recommendations in the report had they been able to take the decision, then my decision is to agree to the recommendations A and B that the updated council plan as set out in appendix one of the report be adopted and that the authority be delegated to the portfolio holder for corporate development and change in consultation with the leader of the council and the chief executive for the final design of the plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan. Right, agenda item nine is to return to in-person full council meetings um, I'm going to ask Councillor Spencer Frow to introduce this report. Th thank you very much, Chairman. And as you just said, this report is specifically about the return to full council meetings. Um, I thought the member survey was a really good process. And in fact, there was a very strong consensus by members, apart from full council, that we should re return to in, in, in person meetings as soon as we could. Um, and the, really, the only question here, I guess, is that. Um, we, we need to make sure the technology is in place. We, you know, we've set some standards uh, in public have had an opportunity during the pandemic to have far more involvement in um, uh, observing our meetings. And we've got webcamming equipment to uh, purchased and, be, and being installed. And really, to, I'm not going to read, not going to go through the report itself, Chairman. I'm, I'm sure colleagues have, have done that. What I am going to do is um, table a, an alternative uh, recommendation and I suspect that it's um, it's one. Is it? Oh, let me read it through. I'm going to read the, my alternative recommendation um, that full council and all committees will return to in-person meetings from when the appropriate webcasting equipment has been installed and tested to the satisfaction of group leaders and anticipated to be by mid-November. In the meantime, informal arrangements will continue as previously agreed by full council on the 4th of May annual council and extended by the chief executive. So it opens up the opportunity for us to, to get the webcam yeah. equipment in place and that and you, most of us will be aware that the next full council meeting is the 14th of December. And I think we need to be optimistic that uh, we'll be able to ha have that meeting in person, Chairman, the first one since whenever it was February 2020. So I'm, I'm going to move that amended recommendation. I believe we've got a seconder. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flyer. I understand that Councillor Les Fly would like, sorry, Fry, not Fly, <laughs> will, would like to second the proposal. Is that correct, Councillor That's Fly? correct. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I would like to second this motion. I know that the majority of members and officers are very keen to get back to face to face meetings but we must work at the pace of those people with the greatest fears, whatever they may be. 
There are also considerable gains for virtual meetings in helping our climate emergency and those who are working full time. Therefore, I fully support this amended motion and it is the best possible way forward and I'm happy to second this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Fry. I understand um, Councillor Wolf would like to make a statement. Is that true, Councillor? That is correct. Thank you, Chairman. Thank it, you. In my position, uh, uh, liaising with staff and having HR responsibilities, um, in considering the approach to be taken for future council and committee meetings, I think it would be useful to provide to members an update on the planned working arrangements for officers and staff and also for customer access as these, th this information will provide further context to the general debate and will ensure that what we are suggesting and what we are doing is in tandem with what is being suggested and acted on for the staff. As members will be fully aware, since March of last year, many of our officers have had their normal work patterns dramatically interrupted by the COVID pandemic. This has meant undertaking their role within the restrictions put in place by the government, which for a large number has seen them working from home either in whole or in part. With the formal restrictions on office workplaces being relaxed, plans are in place for us to deploy the Dorset Workplace, which is the name of our approach, and this is our approach to hybrid working, which allows our teams to work from the locations which are most effective for the delivery of their service. Depending on each job role, this could be a mix of in the office, at home, on site, with clients or customers. From this week, each team is beginning a phased move to hybrid working, and this will build up over a timescale that works for different areas and is therefore is not a standard timescale. But I imagine that by early next year, most of our officers who work allows it will be working in a new and more flexible way. In July, we reopened customer service points in Blanford, Northern Lodge, Bridport, Mountfield, and at our libraries in Dorchester, Wareham, Wimborne and Weymouth. We are actively providing triage services and resolving customer inquiries, covering many council services such as housing, council tax and benefits. And we're also working closely with partners such as Citizen Advice to signpost for additional support. We continue to encourage customers to self-serve online or to use the telephone wherever possible. These are, after all, the most efficient channels which help us focus on those who most need face-to-face -face support who, who cannot go online. We're now working on improving confidential space in our libraries to provide more opportunity for services to meet with customers locally. These plans are being established and will be launched in due course. Finally, I, I can provide some additional information on the timeline for deploying the technology to support webcasting. Although there will inevitably be a settling in period, I'm confident that by mid-November, we will have resilient webcasting provision in place in the council chamber in County Hall, and this will allow much wider public access to our meetings. However, I expect the introduction of this to be frankly lumpy because it is dealing with both new technology and a new way of working. What, what uh, IT and democratic services are doing is that they are testing the use of hybrid equipment and when they've completed that, they will be contacting the chairs of all of the committees, particularly those planning committees outside of Dorchester, to ask them to come with them to trial the equipment before it's used, as you might say, in anger. Can I make a point through you, Chair, that this will not be straightforward and whilst people will have issues with the technology, there are actually issues with the logistics rather than just the technology. Officers have tried it and have found that there are two uh, challenges that they have faced. The first is that there is sometimes a time delay between the response of those people who are communicating virtually, i.e. from a screen, uh, there's a time delay in their response in, in, in contrast to the immediate responses of those people in the room. And the second is, and, and this it wasn't obvious until it was noticed by a number of people, the, the requirement to chair the meeting is made significantly more difficult when you have to pay attention to a screen with a number of people and the people physically in the room. And it will need chairs to really, really be on their 
top form to make sure that people are properly looked out. Um, yes, I, I, I will send an email out, Councillor Ezard, to update and give more information on this. Um, I wasn't sure that we discussed whether it should be in the report. We eventually thought it would be better for me to talk about it as a contextual item, but I think you're right. I think members ought to know that. So in summary, we hope to be by mid-November in a place where we can run hybrid meetings off-site as well as on-site. However, there will be some testing both internally, democratic services and IT, and then there will be a note going out to chairs so that we will set up a dry run where chairs can actually go to a site, try it, and there'll be people acting as, as external uh, virtual attendees, etc. But can I just say that this is likely to be quite lumpy and is unlikely to be absolutely brilliantly smooth from day one. But there is a there is a balance and I want to get this going as soon as possible. I just ask people to be a little bit patient and a little bit forgiving. Sorry to take rather too long, Chair. I thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Councillor Wall. I'm trying to see where we are. Graham Carl-Jones. Um, Councillor Carl-Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, even in a pre-COVID world, the, the members area and the committee rooms at County Hall were not fit for purpose in the 21st century. Frankly, those areas were behind the times 30 years ago in the previous Dorset County Council days. Many of us here have come from the modern council offices and the settings at Southwark's house, where windows are opened with a flick of a switch, to a county hall, a mausoleum of a building, which is quite honestly well past its sell-by date. The committee room's 1970s crittle windows that require a boat to open them are nigh on impossible for someone like myself who has an upper limb disability. The bunker, aka the committee room one, has little ventilation, barely any natural light, and frankly, it's akin to a dungeon without whips and chains. None of our officers work in the old part of the building, save when serving committees. The courts have long gone, even the union offices deserted. So if we don't expect our officers to utilise the space, why would, we, why would it differ for us as members? Access is antiquated and unwelcoming. The council chamber, in my view, should be consigned to the history centre. We are supposed to be a modern, forward-thinking council and being expected to work in an environment that is a relic from the 1950s and all that goes with it does not chime with that sentiment. Madam Chairman, the gentlemen's toilets are like a scene from the film If. The only thing missing there is the ISIL medicated toilet paper. This, of course, will not mean a lot with uh, people under 45. But, post, but in the post-COVID world, our laboratories need to be a safe place to use. I don't expect anyone wants to use the urinals either. Rather difficult in a socially distanced fashion, I'd suggest. So for me, the, the idea of large face-to-face -face gatherings in the business end of County Hall it's like a sketch of carry on up the council. I'm just waiting for Sid James and Hattie jo Jakes to appear mm -hmm. to complete the joke. I do believe that teams meetings are and, and time to be more productive. I certainly get more hours out of my day and my carbon footprint is greatly, greatly reduced. And I say this as a very keen V8 petrol head. However, given the knowledge uh, of the proposed changes and modernisation of said mausoleum, I will be supporting the return to face-to-face -face meetings once it is safe to do so. I am also, of course, more than happy to provide the facilities team the benefit of my knowledge as a real person living with a disability who has life experiences of just getting on with it. That's my offer, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for that enlightening point of view, Councillor Carl Jones. Who do we have next? Uh, Councillor Starr. Councillor Starr, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's just a small point um, that has just been touched on by Councillor Carr, really. Um, uh, uh, this recommendation is as good as it goes, but it doesn't say anything about 
provided that it's safe to do so. But you know, it's, it seems to be um, limited by the fitment of the equipment and getting that working properly. But it's also, it, I know it, it, it will still be done anyway. No, I don't think we'll be going back to meetings if the if uh, the outbreak break comes gets bad again. But I think it's an e it's easy to um, to have the impression that the with COVID's all done, we're all good now. But it could come back, and I think there needs to be in this recommendation just a mention of the fact that um, health advice should be with us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Starr. I'm sure all that will be taken into consideration if needs be. Um, who... Councillor Sutton. Councillor Claire Sutton, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I support the recommendation, although to, to be honest, with with some reluctance, I, I think I think Councillor Starr's point, you know, is a, is a very important caveat. Um, and I very much appreciate um, Councillor Wall's comments on a, on a number of fronts. But um, nevertheless, I, I think there's something bigger picture about this, actually. Um, you know, whilst I understand the appetite of many members to return to in-person meetings, our priority is what best serves the interests of Dorset residents as opposed to, to ourselves, really. And um, local government has functioned in pretty much the same way for decades but has adapted with considerable dexterity to the challenges presented by COVID, which, you know, we, we, we mustn't forget the things that we have learned. Um, while there are obviously downsides to virtual meetings, had tonight's meeting been held in person based on a calculation by one of our highways managers, the marginal cost would have been around £2,400 and the carbon cost nearly 0.8 tonnes of CO2 emissions. Virtual meetings also make the role of councillor more accessible to underrepresented groups such as students, single parents, parents <laughs> and simply those who have a day job. I mean, hybrid is obviously the way the way forward, and and and, and I, I I won't labour this, but obviously you know we we need national government to enable us to to do that in a in a, in a in a legal way. But 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 finally, um, for environmental and financial reasons, and to promote a more diverse council, I hope we will not return to the old way of doing things without reflecting carefully, really carefully, on some of the lessons we've learned. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Sutton. Councillor Lacey Clark. Councillor Lacey Clark. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in fact, Councillor Sutton and Councillor Carr Jones have covered my points much more eloquently than I probably could have. So, thank you. Everything I wanted to say has already been said. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Councillor O'Leary. Thank, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, while I do sympathise with some of Councillor Carr Jones's points, um, I still think County Hall is a magnificent building. But in returns to getting back to face to face meetings, I think, it, um, can I just get clarification that um, returning to face to face meetings is more of a priority than ensuring that the live streaming and the IT is up to date? Um, my opinion is that getting back to face to face meeting is vitally important. Um, democracy dies when it's watered down, and I'm afraid that virtual meetings are a watering down of democracy. And I'm afraid it's time we got back into the chamber. I understand members, some members may have concerns, um, but I mean, we do have the vaccine now. Um, members are permit, you know, members can freely go around their daily business. There's no current legal restrictions. And if we're not going in now, when do we go? You know, we can't continue like this forever. Um, so I just like clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Councillor Flower, would you like to give clarification on that point? Thank you very much, Chairman. It's a bit like curate's egg, isn't it? Because we, we're going, we, we're going to end up for not careful having a debate about something we've had a member survey result, and it's interesting because all of the results, apart from full council, was pretty strongly in favour of in-person meetings, whereas full council, if I'm from memory, was sort of 53-47 to continue with virtual. And as, as uh, Claire Sutton points out very well, that virtual and hybrid meetings we can't have unless we continue with informal, uh, the formal arrangements we currently got. And that's not something I want to support in the in the in medium or long term. We need to get back in the room. We need to be democratic in how we go about our business. But equally, um, we, we mustn't lose sight of the benefits the public have gained 
from the, what we've done. We've done a brilliant job on what we've done on, online. And a lot of people have told me that in the street about they do bother to come and listen to meetings, which he didn't bother with in the past because it was always too difficult. It isn't anymore. We've invested in getting webcam equipment in to ensure that people do get the chance to to witness our, our meetings. And I think that's important. And I pick up um, the comment about safety. Um, there are opportunities to mitigate. You can't eliminate, but you can certainly mitigate risk and anything you do and you know, hand sanitizers. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Um, but you know, the legislation is what it is at the moment. Um, yeah. But yeah, we, we've set ourselves a target chairman and, and I'm, I, I'm quite happy to stick with the recommendation that I've uh, put forward as an amendment to this evening. Thank you very much. Councillor Flower, we will hear next from Councillor Shane Bartlett and then Councillor Molly Rennie, and then we will vote. Four, four more ones. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairman, um, for allowing me to speak. Uh, I was a little bit uh, apprehensive and concerned when I heard that there was going to be a, a revised recommendation just now um, on this agenda item, but having read the original recommendation and reading the one that's on the screen, um, I do feel it is far more concise and far more clinical in its approach, and I am a lot. I am. I'm quite happy with this. Uh, this taken in conjunction with the next agenda item, we've got dispensation for non-attendance at committee meetings. I think um, will help those councillors um, who've got a reduced or compromised immune system or other health implications, either with themselves or with their partners or somebody else that's in, in their household at home that they have direct contact with. So on, on in respect of all of that, I'm, I'm quite happy with this recommendation as it stands. I do take um, other people's comments concerning um, the, the aspect of uh, the when it's safe to do these meetings, but I think as happened before, I think that direction will come from central government. I think they will inform us as to whether or not we can or can't meet. I think that that direction will come from Westminster as it did before. Um, so I think all in all, Madam Chairman, I'm I'm quite happy with this to go to go ahead with this. I, I would say that my last point would be that, and I do chair a committee as you know, and I am vice chair on another one, and I do feel that the longer that uh, virtual meetings have gone on, and, and others will disagree with me on this, but I do believe that the level of debate has deteriorated and I think it is high time for those of us that are able to through and don't have those health implications that we get back into the meeting rooms again. Thank you. Thank you for those wise words, Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Rennie. Thank you very much. A lot of what I want to say have been said already and yes, I think there is huge value in people being together. It's not just about about it's not just about debate, it's about sharing knowledge that we have and being able to say those words out loud and people to listen to you. Um, but I belong to other organisations and have had to spend a bit of time just recently looking for rooms where we could meet as a larger group because the rooms that we are using at the moment are only all right for small people. No, not small people, small <laughs> of people. Careful. Better we take less room up. Um, but we are not explaining to members and to members of the public how we are going to keep everybody safe. And I've noticed this with everywhere that I've looked to book venues. They are very clear in what you have to do and how you are going to do it. And yes. people have mentioned as well the fact we don't have windows we can open, we don't have through airport, and how are we going to manage that? And um, I think if we were to show how we were going to work with COVID regulations and COVID safety, people would feel a lot happier. And if you've only got to look at how how other organisations set it out on their website. And we aren't explaining that sort of thing. We've got responsibility to our staff, to our members and any member of the public who wants to come. So if they were to see it clearly written out and our promise to people, people could make an informed choice about what they want to do. And I would like to see us having more clarification about the mitigation measures, especially opening windows and airflow. Uh, 
And I think our old building is going to prove difficult to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rennie. I realise that actually there were four more councillors wishing to speak. May I ask that if any of those four, Councillor Coombs, Ferrari, Leg and Cook, have got anything to add to that, what's been already said, uh, please go ahead. Councillor Ferrari would like to speak. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I uh, address Councillor Card-Jones' um, comments on disability access? The administration recognises that this is an important issue. Um, and I thank him for his offer of uh, an audit, um, a personal audit of um, what needs to be done with the with the buildings. But the council has already employed a community interest company, DOTS Disabilities, uh, to audit County Hall for us. Uh, DOTS Disabilities are Dorset based. They're a social enterprise um, uh, organisation. Their objective is to enable organisations to improve their services to disabled people, the elderly and carelies, carers. And 75% of the directors have disabilities. They came back with a list of recommendations, making the doors automatic, improving toilet access, making the old courtroom fully a fully accessible meeting room and the council chamber um, overflow, dedicating chamber space for wheelchair users. There's a, there's a long list. The budget for these changes has already been passed by Cabinet uh, and the works will soon be underway. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Coombs. Councillor Coombs, please. Good evening, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I wanted to speak to the motion on the table as Chairman of the Eastern Area Planning Committee. And given the comments that Councillor Wharf has made, um, I now have the confidence to support the motion as proposed and I will be voting in favour of the motion. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Coombs. Councillor Robin Legg. Councillor Robin Legg, please. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to say in response to Councillor Carl Jones that I think that was one of the best speeches that's been made uh, since the inception of the authority. I think it was a very powerful speech and uh, although I'd love to get back to uh, real meetings, proper meetings again, um, I'm going to vote against this recommendation this evening because the point that Councillor Carl Jones really makes is one of, uh, which is really the same point that Molly has made, is, is meeting in a proper, well-ventilated space and in a way that can be done safely. Just because the government doesn't want to act uh, it doesn't mean that we should be um, prepared to fall into their trap that they've set for all of us. Um, I remember reading earlier in the week that the rate, uh, astonishingly, the rate of COVID infection in this country per million people is amongst the highest in, in Europe, not just Western Europe, um, and indeed not just even in Europe. Um, we've got a higher rate of infection than Turkey at the moment. Uh, and a higher rate of infection than in the Ukraine. Um, we've got a significantly higher rate than in uh, some of the Western European countries. Spain, I think, was the lowest, uh, along with France and Italy. Um, and so I think we can be a bit smug in this country sometimes, thinking that we do everything perfectly, when actually we're facing some very significant problems. And what's wrong with this recommendation is it fails to address the adequacy of the buildings that we're going to meet in. I'm, I'm in favour of actually getting back to real meetings because there is a certain dynamic of a real meeting that's absent from a virtual meeting. And it was partly because of the way in which, uh, and it's very difficult for you to chair a meeting um, uh, when everybody is uh, just popping up as postage-sized little talking heads on a screen. Um, I mean, I think there are ways in which um, that can be improved um, uh, to, to make the virtual meetings a, a little more helpful and to have more people of, uh, to be seen on the screen. It's one of the reasons, I think, it, in recent uh, virtual meetings, that there has been a degree of... Um, 
uh, well, not exactly the best of behaviour on the part of members. And that's because when you're sitting at home uh, with your TV, with your monitor switched off and with your um, uh, video feed, feed rather switched off and the microphone switched off, you don't actually feel as if you're part of the meeting. You're an outside observer looking in. So I think we need to, to do something about the building we meet in or the other make use of uh, South Walks House in some way as a building we meet in because of its superior ventilation and moder modernity. Uh, and I can say, apart from the addition of microphones within the council chamber at County Hall, it hasn't really changed at all that chamber in the last 40 years, which is when I first walked into it. So I think uh, there's a lot to be said for what Councillor Carr Jones has said the, this evening. We all ought to reflect upon it. And despite the fact that I want to get back to real meetings, I'm going to vote against this recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Legg. Councillor Robin Cook. Councillor Robin Cook, I, I'm really sorry to hurry you along, Councillor Cook. That's quite all right, yeah. Chairman. Thank you very much for allowing me the time. All I'm going to say is Neil Armstrong said in July 1969, one small step for man, a huge step for mankind. This is a small step for us. I support the recommendation. I think we need to get back to informal meetings, but uh, informal meetings, but, but this will be the shape of the future. Uh, we haven't got crystal balls to, to see what will happen, but I do think this will be the shape of the future for the way that councils operate. Sooner we can get back to it, the better. There will never be a right time, and I understand all that's been said. Sympathise with Graham Carr Jones about County Hall. And as a final one, Chairman, as, as a chairman of the Strategic Planning Committee, I would like to be included in those test runs, although normally our meetings will be held at Dorchester. There may be occasions when we have a very large audience. We may have to go outside uh, the normal council chamber. So I would like to be considered in that group as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, I'm rather surprised that this is going on, taking the time it has actually, given uh, that we were all consulted many months ago now over our preferences, but we'll keep going. I'm sure there's a, only a couple more uh, speeches. Three left, Chairman. Uh, next is uh, Councillor Simon Christopher. Councillor Christopher, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to make some points. Uh, firstly, uh, the survey is now somewhat several weeks out of date and in the general population, less and less people are wearing masks. I've undertaken a survey of the parish councillors in the Marshwood Vale ward within the parish councils and almost to a man they are saying that we should have returned to face-to-face -face meetings already and I think members should bear in mind when we talk about an enclosed space it is somewhat ironic that we are not having a face-to-face -face meeting this evening when there are hundreds of people watching the James Bond film just a few hundred yards down from County Hall in the two cinemas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor. Lastly, is it? Uh, second from last is Councillor Cherry Brooks. Thank you, Councillor Brooks. Yeah, thank you, and I, I, um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak. I realise that uh, that we have already um, given our feedback. We've, I, my view is that we've adapted well to working remotely through the pandemic, um, and uh, we are, we know through some of the work that we've done with highways that we actually have made um, a, some significant impact on the environmental issues. So I think I think that's been good. But the downside, obviously, is that there are no breaks between meetings now so maybe some training uh, on, of people how to set up meetings remotely so that it might ease the situation particularly in relation to um, mental health issues uh, obviously working working without a break all day every day um, is, is not a good thing but one important point that I want to make is that I actually consider myself to have a compromised immune system. During the COVID outbreak, I was classed as um, vulnerable. But the decision is mine 
It's not anybody else's. If I want to go to a face to face meeting, then I, you know, hold that meeting and I will make the decision about whether I attend or not. And and I think we sh don't assume uh, that it, that we need to make all these other um, adjustments. If somebody has a problem uh, with attending the meeting, then then fine, they can make their own arrangements. But I I think it almost sounds like an excuse to me that people might have um, compromised positions. Um, and I just I really just wanted to make that point. But I will be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Um, last one is Councillor David Took. Lastly, we have Councillor David Took, and then we will go to the vote. Thank you. Thank you for the time, Chair. Um, last and, and, and probably least, um, I we've had several months looking at this. COVID's been around for 18 months, two years nearly. Um, we've talked about ventilation, we've talked about opening windows. Um, a lot of schools have faced similar problems and they've put in mechanical ventilation and filtration systems. Have we progressed anywhere with, with doing that for our own committee rooms? And that's my simple question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know the answer. We'll see if we can find out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Councillor Flower, could you help us with that one? Well, I thought it might come my way, Chairman. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what I what I would say to uh, David Took is that I mean Tony Flower might be closer to this than I am, but I think the point about ventilation is well made. The point about mitigation in terms of health you know health and safety and so on is also well made and I, I i don't think we need a recommendation to tell us to do it i think we do it anyway so i think we'll take this the points that have been made well made by some of the colleagues tonight and i'll get tony to have a look at that and perhaps pop out a briefing note just to give members some reassurance that where we've been able to we've taken some uh, action to deal with some of the issues around ventilation and and the other aspects of the covid safety okay Chairman. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Okay, Susan, would you like to um, post up our options, please? Thank you, Chairman. So the voting form is now in the chat bar. So, and just for clarity, the recommendation that members are voting for voting for tonight is the one that is showing on the screen. And just to remind any member who does have a technical difficulty, please could you wait until I ask for those votes at the end of the electronic voting? Thank you. Chairman, all of the electronic votes have now been received. Can I just check if there's any member who has had difficulty with the voting form? No, I don't see any messages in the chat for bar, in which case I can tell you that the uh, vote in favour of the recommendation is 59 against 10 and one abstention. Therefore, the minded to vote is in favour of the recommendation. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you took my vote with that or not. Susan. I think we were on mute at the time, Chair, oh, unfortunately. Well. Yes. OK, so, in that case, Chairman, if, would you like to tell me you how add, you voted? Could you add one, please, to um, of course. support? Thank you. In, in which case, the votes in favour were 60 votes in favour of the recommendation. Thank you very much. I have an apology to make um, when I, <coughs> excuse me, last asked Mr. Aidan Dunn to take, make the formal decision under delegated powers. I didn't actually introduce him by title. Aidan is the Executive Director for Corporate Development and Chief Finance Officer. So um, now I've given him his proper title, perhaps he'll 
help us out with our minded to vote. Uh, thank you, Chair. And to uh, just to clarify the point, the uh, Chief Executive is absent this evening and uh, in his absence, he has delegated his authority to me for the purposes of this meeting. Now, having listened to the debate and having taken into account that members would have been minded to support the recommendation in the report, had they been able to make a decision, then my decision is to agree to the recommendation that is laid out in front of us that full council and all committees will return to in-person meetings from when the appropriate webcasting equipment has been installed and tested to the satisfaction of group leaders. November <coughs> 2021. And in the meantime, informal arrangements will continue as previously agreed by full council at the 4th of May annual council and extended by the chief executive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan. And we can now move along smartly to agenda item 10, dispensation for non-attendance at committee meetings, which of course follows the last agenda item. Um, I'm going to ask Councillor Flower to introduce the report and propose the recommendation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, colleagues, I'm going to take a risk and say I think this is really straightforward. Um, we have had dispensation in place um, and I think it expires around the, the the first week or so of November. And what this does, it takes us through to the 14th of April. And, and I mentioned this to our MPs uh, when we met very recently, and they all said this has happened all over the country. And what I would say is we've had the dispensation for colleagues who have, do find it difficult to, to, to be able to be in person, and we haven't had an issue. You know, this is a, a safeguard to make sure no no colleague who can't go to a physical meeting because of a, a, you know some sort of medical reason not find themselves disqualified from their role as a councillor. And I think this is a more than sensible approach. I said we're only mirroring what's been done across the country. So I will move the recommendation, Chairman. And I believe there is a seconder. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that Councillor Claire Sutton would like to second this proposal. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Spencer. Yeah, very, very happy to second them. Um, and also um, to reiterate that I don't think we really need to talk about this. You know, this, this, you know, is, yeah, it's just to be agreed, I would hope. Thank you. Well, unless someone has a burning um, wish to make some comment, we're going to go straight to the vote, please. Thank you, Chairman. The voting form is now in the chat bar. And just once again, if any members can't vote, then please could they wait until the electronic votes have come in? Thank you. Chairman, I think all the electronic votes have uh, been received now. Can I just check if any member has had a technical difficulty? No, in which case uh, the votes in favour of the uh, recommendation are 71 in favour and against two votes. Therefore, there is a minded to decision to um, carry the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Over to you then, Aidan, if you do this for courtesy thank you thank you uh, having listened to the debate uh, and having taken into account that members would have been minded to support the recommendation in the report had they been able to take the decision then my decision is to agree to the recommendation as laid out in the paper in front of you thank you very much in her on agenda item 11 appointment of temporary members appointment of temporary members to parish councils I'm going to ask Councillor Flower to introduce the report and propose the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Well, I think, again, I, I'll take the risk of saying I think this is straightforward, if a little unfortunate that a parish council finds itself in quarret because of re recent resignations of councillors. But we have a duty as the upper tier uh, council to, to deal with the uh, matters of the day in the parish until such times as that matter can be resolved. So. You, you see, the, I'm not going to read the recommendation, colleagues. You can see what the recommendation says. 
and um, I'll, I'll move the recommendation set out in the report and I believe there is a seconder chairman thank you thank you very much um, I believe Councillor Les Fry would like to second the proposal Chair, yes, I will. Thank you. But can I let um, Councillor Emma Parker speak first? I believe she needs to speak first and I will come in afterwards. Absolutely. I was going to ask her to speak after you had seconded, but um, that's fine. Uh, you are seconding though. Are you Councillor Fry? Yes, I am. I'm very happy to second this thing Bye. in order to ensure that democracy is maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank um, you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, um, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I was just saying. I, thank you. I just want to make um, uh, uh, probably not a declaration of interest or, or of an interest that I was chairman of Winterbourne White Church Parish Council, which has been named on this. So I thought it was important that I, I say that. And I was one of the people that resigned and I do support the recommendation for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Um, was there anything you want you wish to add, Councillor Fry, to your uh, seconding the proposal? No, I think sometimes on these counts, Chair, the least said the better. But I'm happy to second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Knock, Lacey Clark. Councillor Lacey Clark, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a um, slight issue with this, actually, um, not in the appointing members, but in the way it's being done. We're, we're meant to be a member led authority. And at the moment, the fact we're only making minded two decisions kind of irks me enough. Um, but in this, we're delegating the authority to the chief executive after consultation with group leaders and the local member. Personally, I would like to see that as giving delegated authority to the group leaders after consultation with the chief executive and local member. We're a member led council and it should be members making the ultimate decisions. Um, and that's my feeling. And I don't know if it's a legal reason we're doing this. If so, maybe Jonathan can correct me. But if there's no legal reason to give it to the chief executive, I would actually like to propose an amendment. So it's the opposite way around. Um, can I just stop you there, Councillor Lacey Clark, and invite um, Jonathan Mayor to uh, say a word? Kevin, thank, thank you very much. And I realise I made the same mistake as others earlier and I didn't introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jonathan Mayer, I'm the Corporate Director for Legal and Democratic and the Council's Monitoring Officer. Uh, there, is a, there is a legal reason for this, Councillor Lacey Clark. My, my, my preference is always to have a, a member named as the decision maker where we can. And in an authority operating executive arrangement, uh, then a member, uh, then the leader or a member of the cabinet can usually make an individual decision where the decision is an executive decision. This isn't an executive type of decision, so it can only be made by members acting collectively in the full council or a committee or by an individual officer with delegated powers. It can't be made by an individual member uh, as the named decision maker acting in consultation with an officer. So for technical reasons, it has to be expressed as a decision of the chief executive after consulting a member. Thank you very yeah, much, Jonathan. That's, Obviously. That's, the reason, that's the reason for it. And, I, and I'm sure that the chief executive will want to be led on an issue like this uh, by the group leaders and the experience of individual members who, first and foremost, we will be looking to, to step, step in as temporary parish councillors when, when this is needed. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Obviously, I, I don't like that answer, but I understand that if that is the legal side and the way we have to do it, then that's absolutely fine. And I withdraw my amendment. Thank you very much, Councillor Lacey Clark. Uh, Councillor David Took. Councillor David Took. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I think this is, the, the, I don't have any real issues with this. I think it's good, but I do have a a point that I'd like to clarify uh, is, is what's the pool of candidates, as it were, from which the chief exec will select appropriate parish councillors? So how are they going to be put forward? Can, are people putting themselves forward? 
So normally in a co-option process, somebody would apply to be co-opted. Now I understand obviously uh, if the parish is non quorate um, they can't be co-opted, but it, would it be a similar process to actually identify who should be appointed um, at the discretion of the chief, chief executive? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Took. We'll ask Spencer Flower that question. Well, Chairman, it's, 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 I take the point that um, uh, David Took's making, but I, I think it's, it's based on um, uh, process. And I'm going to refer to Jonathan because there is a clear um, legal process that we have to go through and how we end up with temporary um, parish councillors. Now, can I ask through you, Chairman, can we ask Jonathan to uh, explain that point, please? Chairman, the first point, if, if you're willing for me to explain this, is that I, I'd emphasise that these are temporary <laughs> parish councillors mm -hmm. and the intention would be that these temporary councillors would be put in place by Dorset Council to enable a parish council uh, that couldn't otherwise put councillors in place to co-opt. So in the case of Winterbourne White Church Parish Council at the moment, that council is in Quarret. It has one councillor. It cannot co-opt. So this would just be a temporary measure to enable a parish council to, to, um, to co-opt councillors for itself then and to get back on, on its feet. There is no legal restriction on who Dorset Council can appoint as a temporary parish councillor. The Act doesn't say that it's limited, for instance, to Dorset Council councillors, but I think that you as members would be primarily the people we would look to as a, as a pool to draw upon. And I saw Councillor Robin Legg um, on the screen a few moments ago, and I think he's had some recent experience of being drafted in in exactly this sort of position to make a parish council for us when it would not otherwise have been able to meet. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so does that mean that this temporary parish council will then be for one or two meetings and, and then resign themselves or, or, or be removed? So they won't be a permanent member of the council, though they're, they're simply a very temporary. Is that, that that that's what I'm understanding you're saying? Chairman that <coughs> Pardon me, uh, Chairman, that is certainly the expectation that they would be drafted in temporarily to enable the Parish Council to operate until, for instance, either elections can be held or until uh, or until uh, additional councillors can be co-opted. Thank so you. Very much a temporary position. OK, are you happy with that? Sir? Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Councillor Robin Legg. Councillor Legg. Councillor Robin Legg. Well, I think this question is going to re require Jonathan to make another appearance on the screen. Um, uh, I was appointed last year, uh, back in September of last year, uh, as a temporary member of Holwell Parish Council because they were in, in Core 8. And I served on that council in until May of this year. And um, it was a, an interesting experience. Um, but the question I have to ask Jonathan is why is this paper before us this evening? Because you had the power to appoint me last year and I'm not quite sure I understand why it's necessary now to um, bring this particular paper forward uh, in relation to Winterbourne Whitechurch. Thank you. First of all, this, this paper isn't just in relation to Winterbourne White Church. This paper is in relation to it prompted by the situation in Winterbourne, um, but it is to establish a, a specific delegation to the Chief Executive for the, for the future. Uh, but the last time around, we relied upon the Chief Executive's general delegated authority uh, to act in a case of urgency. Um, I would prefer not to do that. I would prefer to have a specific delegation to the Chief Executive, but I wouldn't have brought this to you tonight if it had not been uh, for the situation in Winterbourne White Church. If that's satisfactory, Councillor? He's gone. Yes, no, uh, yes, thank you very much. OK, thank you. Is that it? 
Wow, I think we've uh, managed to answer all the questions and I would now like to put this um, recommendation to the vote, please. Thank you, Chairman. So the voting form is now in the chat bar. Chairman, I think all the electronic votes are now in. Can I just check if there's any member who's had a technical difficulty? No, nope. in which case, uh, Chairman, the result of the vote is 71 votes in favour, two votes against, no abstentions. Therefore, the mind to two decision is to approve the recommendation. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, it's been put to me that it wouldn't be appropriate um, that the delegated authority is given to the chief executive. Um, in fact, in this particular um, <clears throat> proposal that we voted through. So I'm going to ask Jonathan Mayer, Corporate Director, Legal and Democratic, um, to um, follow the minded to vote and ask him to take formal form decision under delegated powers. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, thank you. I've, I've listened to uh, the members' debate of this item. There was more debate of it than, than I thought there would be. Um, and um, taking into account that and uh, the members minded to uh, vote, uh, my decision is that delegated authority is given to the Chief Executive after consultation with group leaders and the local member to enable the appointment of temporary parish councillors where a parish <coughs> council would otherwise be in quorum. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So we now move to agenda item 12, urgent items. There, in fact, are no urgent items. Um, agenda item 13 is exempt business, and there is no exempt business. So at, at 20.37, I'd like to close this meeting. Thank you for your attendance and uh, keep safe. Thank you.